Hi everyone, welcome to Non-Communicable Diseases and the Global Crisis, Lesson 7.2. So there are four main risk factors, and these are the drivers of these four diseases, and they're shared across cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, and chronic respiratory diseases. They share causes, and so they, they also share opportunities for prevention and mitigation against these for communicable diseases. And so this is a really essential point that if we were to address tobacco consumption, unhealthy diets, insufficient exercise, and alcohol misuse, it would go a long way in mitigating all four diseases. And so this is a big bang for each public health buck. So heart disease and stroke. Cardiovascular diseases, or CVDs, are the number one cause of death globally. They represent 31% of all deaths, and low middle income countries are disproportionately affected with over 80% of CV deaths happening in low middle income countries. And I'm currently doing some research on this in Northern Ghana. Canada and heart disease is the second leading cause of death Every seven minutes, someone dies. It's 29% of all deaths. And our indigenous population is 1.5 to two times higher. And it has an enormous financial cost for all Canadians on our healthcare budget, uh, heart disease and stroke. Heart disease affects men and women differently. Men typically will present with a heart attack, whereas women tend to present with vague feelings of fatigue, maybe exercise intolerance, just not feeling well. And so that's why women are actually diagnosed 10 years later than men. And so that's the difference. So making it known that men and women present with heart disease differently. Hypertension is the number one non-modifiable risk factor. And our goals for hypertension from WHO are to have a blood pressure below 140 on 90. And if you have diabetes or renal disease, your blood pressure should be below 130 on 80. And this is really important for you to know as a nurse that you need to know the numbers and teach your patients. If you have a patient in the hospital or community setting that has a blood pressure above one of these ranges, it's very important that you educate your patient and have them go and see their primary care provider. Diabetes is a silent killer. 422 million people or adults have diabetes. 1.6 million deaths are directly related to diabetes. And one in three adults aged over 18 years is either overweight and one in 10 are obese. And we know those are both risk factors for diabetes. 70% occur in low and middle income countries. Again, the inequities and diabetes is linked with poverty. Diagnosing diabetes. A fasting blood glucose above seven millimoles to trigger you to think about, is this patient a diabetic? A random blood glucose above 11.1 millimoles, again, should trigger you to think about, is this patient diabetic? And this is really something important for you to understand that there are actually have identified a pre-diabetic state and it's a fasting blood glucose of between 6.1 and 6.9. And they have found that 50% of patients with pre-diabetes will go on to develop type 2 diabetes. And so this is really important for nurses to know. So you can, we're, we're all, chronic diseases is all about preventing pre um, early death related to chronic diseases. And so we want to prevent those early deaths. And so if you can recognize early on in your patients that they may be pre-diabetic, then you know we can start to work with patients and look at their diet, look at their weight, maybe start them on some type of hypoglycemics to help with this pre-diabetic stage. And so it's very important, again, for nursing to know the numbers and teach your patients. This was uh, diabetes in Canada, but I want to just bring you to this one. The estimated pre-diabetes prevalence in Canada is 22.1%. So that's very, very high. So again, the importance of really understanding that pre-diabetic state. So moving on to lung diseases. 
So chronic respiratory diseases cause approximately 7% of all deaths worldwide. And most asthma deaths are attributed to lack of proper treatment. And so important for asthmatics to get the proper tre treatment, but more importantly to understand how to use their puffers and when to use their puffers. And the other thing is that there's some deadly synergies that are existing be between some diseases. Between HIV, HIV, AIDS, and TB, there seems to be a coexistence between those diseases, as well as COPD and lung cancer. Lung disease in Canada, lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer death, and COPD is the lead, leading cause of lung disease hospitalization. And so we see this because of the increasing demand tied to the aging population. Cancers are the second leading cause of death globally, one in six deaths, and they account for an estimated 9.6 million deaths, or about one in six deaths as I've said. Lung, prostate, colorectal, stomach, and liver cancer are the most common types of cancer in men, while breast, colorectal, lung, cervical, and thyroid cancers are the most common among women. The number of new cases expected is to rise to 70% over the next two years. And 70% of deaths will occur in low middle income countries because of the lack of screening and prevention and treatment in low middle income countries. Cancers are linked to infections. Just think of HPV or hepatitis and liver cancer, nutrition and alcohol and environmental pollutants. So cancer in Canada is the number one cause of death. Uh, nearly half of all Canadians will develop cancer during their lifetime, and about one quarter of Canadians are expected to die from cancer. And so these are staggering, um, these are staggering statistics if you actually go around and read them all. The five-year cancer survival is about 63%, so that is definitely increased. Um, but this one in two Canadians will de develop cancer in their lifetime. That's shocking. So again, to think about what we need to consider when we're thinking about cancer prevention. So again, back to these shared risk factors. Let's look at these. So tobacco use. It is the number one modifiable risk factor for all those top four non-communicable diseases. Tobacco remains legal, although it kills more than 55 million, sorry, it kills more than 5 million people each year, including one person who dies every minute from secondhand smoke. And so for nursing, it's very important for you to ask the question, if your patients are a smoker, to speak to them about the risk factor of tobacco smoking, speak about smoking cessation and reduction reduction. Think about where you could send the patient for counseling, talk to their primary care provider about medication or nicotine replacement therapy. It's so, so important. This is, what, this is something I typically talk about in class. Do you think plain packaged smoking or cigarettes will help bring about the end game for tobacco? So just something to think about. Alcohol consumption. 280 deaths every hour, one in 10 deaths of young people between the ages of 15 to 29, and it's the world third largest risk factor. These are Canada's low risk alcohol drinking guidelines and they haven't changed much in the last 10 years. So I find them very high. So these are the low risk alcohol drinking guidelines. Reduce your long-term health risk by drinking no more then 10 drinks a week for women with no more than two drinks a day most days, 15 drinks a week for men with no more than three drinks a day most days, and plan non-drinking days every week to avoid developing a habit. So just something to think about. These are our low risk drinking guidelines. Unhealthy diets. So having an unhealthy diet is a risk for secondary risk factors for obesity and also our NCDs. So as we've already said, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And so for nursing, it's very important to understand what a healthy diet is. So a healthy diet is low in fat, low in cholesterol, low in salt. For the most part, a plant-based diet is better than a meat-based diet and a calorie restriction.
So do you think calorie counting works? So as you can see now, in the last couple of years, we see on our menus the amount of calories that people are ingesting with whatever food item they choose. And I would talk about this in class as to whether you think this is actually a great strategy for moving forward. Do you think we should continue this or do you think it hasn't had any benefit? And then our last one is physical um, activity or inactivity. It's the main cause for approximately one in four cases of breast and colon cancers and a third of diabetes and heart disease burden. So physical inactivity is very important. They have found that they could link it to one in 20 deaths globally related to the cardiovascular disease deaths and diabetes and also our cancer deaths. So these are the recommendations, 30 minutes walking most days of the week and to start at 10 to 15 minutes three times a week and increase as tolerated. So this is important for you to understand what the parameters are for exercise and you want your patients to be at 30 minutes walking most days of the week. This is just an upstream way to think about exercise. So Beijing puts the work and workout and so employees in this city assemble two times a day for eight minutes of aerobics to a soundtrack of lively music from the Beijing sports radio. So just way to incorporate exercise into the workplace. So this is a way to look at the barriers to exercise by incorporating it right into your own workplace. So just to stop or to end, with remembering that 80% of NCDs are preventable by just looking at these four modifiable shared risk factors. But we can't forget about the social determinants of health. So this is a great analogy. So imagine a middle-aged woman presents to her doctor with an outcome of heart disease. Biologically, the doctor may think that it's cholesterol or even obesity which led her to her disease. But when you think about it, there are other factors that could have led to her disease of heart, heart disease. What is her level of health knowledge? What were her coping and health practices? Maybe she was a smoker or, or drank alcohol. What biological or genetic predispositions did she have? What about her childhood and the environment in which she grew up? The income and social status, the education level, employment opportunities. What social supports did she have to avoid the disease? Were her parents smokers? You know, these are all things to consider. And so when you're thinking about tackling non-communicable diseases, yes, you're looking at the preventable risk factors and you're looking upstream, but it's also to look at, yes, prevention, but also the social determinants of health. And then you always need to have that downstream treatment focus as well. So they go hand in hand. So investing in primary health care, we talked about the importance of primary health care. It allows to identify and address the modifiable risk factors. It allows for screening of common NCDs. It allows for diagnosis, treatment, and more importantly, follow-up. It allows for us to look at the socio-environmental factors. And so a primary health care approach is a fantastic way to look at NCDs. And then lastly is task shifting the management of NCDs to nurses. We see a lot of nurse-led clinics now for diabetes, for heart disease. And so thinking about more about task shifting the management of these non-communicable diseases to nursing. And would that allow for more prevention and maybe better treatment of patients who are, who will develop NCDs who are, or who already do have NCDs. Something to think about.